Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjim Sangari, and this episode's topic will be a recent research paper done studying the effects of disrupting the circadian rhythm. This study will prove useful in understanding the functions and barriers of the circadian rhythm, combined with understanding the consequences of an inconsistent sleep cycle. With me today, I have Dr. Norman F. Ruby, a senior research scientist at Stanford University. Dr. Ruby is an expert on everything about the circadian rhythm and one of the main authors of the research study. Welcome, Dr. Ruby. Thank you for appearing on the podcast. It's an honor to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So to begin with, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the background science of your research with the circadian rhythm. So what exactly is the circadian rhythm and what are its functions in the human body? Sure. Uh, Circadian rhythms, the field is more formally known as chronobiology. And in chronobiology, um, we talk about uh, biological clocks. And the circadian rhythm is a biological clock with a period of 24 hours. I think it's worth mentioning just briefly that, um, you know, going back to when biological clocks were first discovered, no one believed that such a thing was possible. You know, how can a piece of living tissue measure time on such long scales? Um, and there are some animals which I've studied which have circannual clocks that you can measure an entire year. So eventually people began to believe in them. And then in 1960, there was a big symposium um, in which the field shifted from are these real to how do they work? And the formal properties of these timing devices started to be established. And then moving into the 1990s, into the aughts, um, the molecular basis of rhythms was discovered. And now we're in a new period, which is what is their application for medicine? Um, How do they affect uh, things that people care about, things like dementia and cancer, which we can talk about. But to answer your question about defining this, essentially a circadian rhythm is a self-sustaining oscillation that lasts about 24 hours. And what that means is, Um, There were studies done, oh gosh, back in the 1950s, where uh, some of the early uh, chronobiologists went um, into caves and lived underground in caves where it was completely dark to see if things like body temperature, sleep, blood pressure oscillated on a 24-hour rhythm. And sure enough, they found that without the alternating day and night in the real world, that these rhythms persisted. And so if you look at um, animals, plants, yeast, bacteria, and by the way, bacteria go back three and a half billion years and they have circadian clocks. And what that means is your physiology, everything in your body, your energy that's available for you to use is based on this clock. So if you were living in a cave, you would still fall asleep about every 24 hours. Um, it's not something that's driven by the cycles around us. So it's very different. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of homeostasis, but homeostasis is sort of like a thermostat in your house. You set it at temperature, and if it gets too hot, it kicks in the cooling system. If it gets too cold, it kicks in the heating system. Homeostasis corrects an imbalance. Circadian rhythms are really interesting because they're different. They don't correct something that's gone wrong, they anticipate problems before they happen. It's going to be night, you're going to need to sleep. So it starts to prepare your brain to quiet down so that you can sleep that's regulated by a circadian clock. So that's what they are. They're self-sustaining oscillations that are then synchronized to the world around us. And it's worth noting that biological clocks are never equal to 24 hours. If you let them run on their own in in a cave, for instance, they can range from 23 to 25 hours. So it's like a cheap wristwatch, which I I have one that my grandfather owned. And every day you have to reset it because it's always off by a minute or two, which today with all our modern devices is unthinkable. But biological clocks are like that. They're good enough to get you in the ballpark. And then the daily light dark cycle resets it each day. Wow, that's incredible that like um, every species has sort of this circadian uh, rhythm that they operate on about a 24-hour basis. So 
uh, humans have discovered a um, long time before that uh, exactly what runs the 24 hour clock, exactly how much time that needs to be for the for like their clocks to run uh, the same every day. So for animals, is it about the same or do they allow for more wiggle room? Um, it, it, yeah, in general, the answer is yes, it's about the same. What's interesting about this is not only is it the same in animals, but it's about the same in plants and single cell organisms. It is quite clear that over the course of evolution, biological timing for, for circadian rhythms has been conserved. You see it quite literally in all living things with one exception that has been documented, and that is in reindeer. Reindeer live up north of the Arctic Circle. And when you get that far north, well, in the middle of summer, it's just light, you know, 24 hours a day for long periods. And in the winter, it's just dark for weeks at a time. Um, it's an interesting difference. But for most organisms that live at the equator and within, you know, maybe 60 degrees north and south, which is most living things, yes, they have these biological clocks. And the way they work in humans is the same as they do in all these other animals and plants. Right. So you brought up how reindeer don't actually uh, follow this sort of 24 hour cycle, uh, which is pretty interesting that it's they're the only species that really has been documented to follow this. So um, do you know how they uh, accommodate for their sleep cycles? Uh, because I'm sure they need to uh, rest as well. Right. They absolutely do. Um, you know, when you turn to sleep, you're asking a very interesting question because you know, there's an old saying that, you know, Mother Nature finds a way, you know, she really does. She just solves problems. So um, I'll come back to reindeer in a minute. But if you look at dolphins, the way they sleep is half the brain, the left brain sleeps while the right brain is operating things. And then it switches the right brain sleeps while the left brain is operating things. And that way they can swim and cover tremendously long distances without stopping. So yes, they're sleeping, but they don't stop moving you know, when they migrate, especially and whales, of course, migrate thousands of miles. Birds do the same thing. They're birds that fly from, you know, up in the, you know, um, you know, Norway, Sweden, down to Europe. It's a long trip. There's nowhere to stop. There's a lot of ocean underneath you um, and, and land without food. Um, and you get the same thing. You know, Mother Nature figures it out. There's no reason why that you, you can't, why you have to have the entire brain sleep at once. Um, so for reindeer, it's tough. There, there's really not a lot known except the documentation that this occurs, that they don't seem to have these rhythms. It's hard to get funding um, and get people who want to go live up near the Arctic Circle for long periods of time and follow reindeer around in sub-freezing temperatures and <laughs> document this. So I'm afraid that's a question that's just going to have to go unanswered for now. I see. And so now we have sort of an understanding of what the circadian rhythm is, uh, how it works in different species, humans and otherwise. So now I wanted to ask you a little more uh, specific to your uh, research study that you recently conducted. So getting into a little more detail, what did your research team work on or do in your study specific to the circadian rhythm? Sure. Um, well, this research goes back, uh, well, I would say, well, first of all, I've worked with these animals. Most sci lab scientists, you work with mice or rats. And with mice, there's all kinds of genetic variants to work with. The animals I work with, they're called Siberian hamsters. And they are a type of hamster that um, is indigenous to Siberia, um, to an area that is up near the Arctic Circle. And their native habitat, a really warm day in the middle of summer, um, the temperatures are, are almost as high as freezing. They are always in an extraordinarily cold environment. The reason we study them, started studying them, is because they exhibit seasonal rhythms. Um, that is, their physiology changes from summer to winter. It's an adaptation for animals that live in, in harsh climates. Anyway, having them in the lab, the reason I started studying them in the context you're referring to is because we had a little accident in the lab one day. Not, not really an accident. I had an undergraduate working for me and we had the animals set up um, in a room just measuring body temperature um, and their activity in the cage. And at the last minute, he had to cancel out. He was an undergraduate, by the way. He had to cancel out on the project 
um, because he needed to go make money for the summer. Uh, he was a programmer and he went up to Microsoft for the summer. After he left, I had ignored the animals for a while, but what I had done was in the laboratory, you don't have day and night, so you have lights on timers and you have to simulate this. Laboratories tend to have their mice on 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. So they synchronize to that light dark cycle. My These hamsters are a little different. They're in 16 hours of light, eight hours of dark, because when you're that far in northern latitude in the summer, that's the, what their breeding season is. The, the, it's, we're trying to mimic that breeding season. In the lab, that meant that the lights came on at two o'clock in the morning. No one wants to come in at two o'clock in the morning to do anything. So after he left, I shifted it so they would come on at seven in the morning. Doing that to an animal in a lab is like giving them jet lag. It's like flying them five time zones uh, going east, going west to east. Excuse me, going east to west. Okay. It's what we would call a phase delay. And when I went back and looked at the activity patterns of the animals, I saw all kinds of crazy things that you have never been reported in the scientific literature. And one of them was that the animals, uh, some of the animals lost their rhythms entirely. They just had no circadian timing. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, and so because of that, uh, I thought this is odd because it's, biologically impossible. This can't happen. In the thousands of research papers in the field, no one has ever seen such a thing. So I thought about it for a while and it occurred to me that what I had here was an animal that lacked circadian timing. And now I could ask a completely different kind of question, which is what does it cost an animal to lose its circadian timing? which is another way of saying what are the functional significance? What, is the fu what are the functions that are served by circadian rhythms? Because now in their absence, we can see what it imp how it impacts the animal. There are a lot of people doing research asking similar questions. We know now that circadian rhythms are really have a big impact on tumor progression and cancer, development of diabetes, uh, you know, declining cognitive abilities, dementia to Alzheimer's disease. So I brought the animals, so I took these animals, I did some studies to refine this a little bit. So now what I found is I can turn on the lights in the animal room late at night for two hours, the next day, give them jet lag, and the combination of those two things wipes out their circadian timing. But what's important is before that project, there was no other way to do this than to, than to go into the brain and surgically ablate the part of the brain that controls rhythms. The second way to do it was to use genetic techniques to knock out or silence the genes that are that are the core of the circadian timing mechanism. So what I had here was something that was more akin to what happens in humans. Um, as we age, we have you get the decline of this biological clock. Associated with that is often memory deficits in elderly people. And it's only been for the last five or six years that clinicians and scientists have started to believe that there's a causative effect there, that that decline in cognition is due to this malfunctioning biological clock, which is somehow interfering with, cog with memory. And that is the basis of what I'm doing in the laboratory. I'm trying to answer the question, how does a malfunctioning clock impair memory? So what do you do? The first thing you do is you take some animals and you give them memory tests. You put them in a maze and see if they can solve a maze. You do something different. You see if they can remember an object they've seen. So you put them in a little arena with two objects. They could be anything like two like children's toys or two blocks or two Legos that are identical. And you take the animal out. And then sometime later, an hour, 24 hours, you bring them back and put them back in. But this time, you swap in a, a different object. So one of the objects they saw yesterday and the new one, the other one is completely new. And what happens is a normal animal will spend a lot more time with the new object because they remember the old one. So that's an index of memory, okay? They remember the old one so they don't have to spend time with it. But you shut off circadian rhythms and the animal forgot. It, it doesn't remember. It spends the same amount of time with both objects. So it doesn't remember. In fact, if you do this, you show them two objects, take them out, put a new object in, 
just 20 minutes later, they cannot remember something they saw earlier. This is an animal in an isolated chamber with only two objects in it. It is like if you were sitting at home and there's a skyscraper on one side of your house and a, you know, a farm on the other. And 20 minutes later, you couldn't remember that, that there was a skyscraper and a farm. You know, you, you, it's, like, it's like they're so vastly different and you still can't remember that. So that's a major cognitive deficit. After we documented these things, the paper that you read and, and uh, are referring to is actually part, um, a companion paper to another paper that we published. And what we did was we said, all right, well, where in the brain is this problem? You know, we know what parts of the brain are critical for memory. So something's got to be wrong there. And uh, <laughs> the paper that you read was the end of a seven and a half year project to get that, to finish that. It was a very difficult to do. But what we found was that this, this part of the brain was malfunctioning. The area where, where it's called uh, the hippocampus. And in the hippocampus, it's critical for navigation and exploration. If you, you know, walk from here to there, if you, you go to school and you walk around the corridors, imagine if every time you went into your school, you had to think about how to get from the door to a classroom. The first day you showed up, you had to do that. But after that, you don't even think about it. You just walk around, you know, because what your brain has done is formed what we call a cognitive map. In your brain, you have basically a map representing the area and you refer to that. Even if you're talking to a friend, you just know where to go. You don't even think about it. That kind of information is stored in the hippocampus. And so in the paper you read, um, we found several things wrong there. Um, it can get complicated, but I can explain them to you if you would like. <laughs> no, I think that would be great. Okay. So, so let me give you some context. The brain works by balancing two competing drives. One is excitation and the other is inhibition. There are many kinds of brain cells, but basically you can put them into two categories and neurons and glia. And we'll just talk about neurons and leave the rest of it. Neurons are the cells that, that do the, head, the, the, the real computing in the brain. And like I said, there are many kinds of them, but they work, they have electrical properties, meaning you can stick an electrode into a, into a neuron and record electrical activity. Given that you can do that, um, you can then describe the electrical activity in a circuit, just like a wiring circuit. Um, in fact, when people talk about neuronal circuits, they sketch them out just like you an electrical engineer would. Um, you have resistance, you have flow, you have current, you have voltage. All of these things are present. Granted, they're very small. You're talking about voltage in terms of millivolts, thousands of volts. The brain, it's interesting. If you have, um, in terms of excitation and inhibition, when you wake up in the morning, before you wake up, the brain starts to shift into a more excited state. And this is what wakes you up. If it gets overly excited, you get very jumpy and agitated. And if it gets even more excited, neurons will die because the overexcitation kills them. Okay. If you go the other direction, you're going to bed at night. Now the brain starts to increase levels of inhibition and it starts to quiet the brain now so you can sleep. If it, if it does it too much, you'll slip into a coma, you do it even more and you die. So it's the balance that is the key in the brain. Um, now, if you break that down into the circuits in the brain, we focused on back going back to the hippocampus, we focused on one particular circuit. And in this circuit, it's where a lot of the, um, environmental stimuli in the brain, the stuff that you remember when you have a memory. So you walk into your school, you remember how you, you have a sense of how wide the hallway is and where you are standing in relationship to it the sounds, the smells, the time of day, the intensity of the lights, all of these things are getting coded into your memory. But sight, smell, tactile sensations all come from different parts of the brain and they converge in the hippocampus to be to what psychologists call, it, it's, it's binding, you're binding these sensory inputs 
to create a memory. Now that memory is stored in these circuits and for it to be encoded and then for you to remember it, to recall it later, you have to have this balance. And what we found is that the memory deficit in these animals, they have much too much inhibition in these circuits um, for reasons we don't quite know. Really at this point, we're just documenting it. Um, so this over inhibition means that the, the neurons can never get active enough to either fully encode or recall these memories. And that is at the core of these, of these deficits. Now, what's interesting about that is it also uh, involves a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And you'll hear about people talk about cholinergic transmission. One of the treatments for people with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia is called a cholinesterase inhibitor. So when you have two brain cells that come together, they form a tiny gap called a synapse. Chemicals are released from one across the synapse and taken up by the other. Acetylcholine, when it's released and taken up, it, when, in, that, in that tiny, tiny space, it, it degrades rapidly. There's an enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, that breaks it down. And if it doesn't get to the other side, if too much of it is broken down, you have memory deficits. And this is one of the leading theories of Alzheimer's disease. So there are drug companies that make what are called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. That is, they, they sort of bind up a lot of that enzyme so that the acetylcholine can cross the gap and continue the signal transmission. So what we're looking at, I think, is we have sort of discovered, on the one hand, something new, and on the other hand, something all people already know. What you have, this, the basic problem is that in the hippocampus, this cholinergic transmission is impaired. That is the halt, that is almost, that, that is one of the key things that happens in dementia. But now what we're saying, it's being caused by a previously unappreciated source, that is the breakdown of circadian timing. Right. So in your research paper that your team published, um, you talked about two specific effects of that disrupting the circadian rhythm uh, with these hamsters, with these Siberian hamsters had. Uh, the first was synaptic inhibition, which you uh, just talked about. And the other one was something called cholinergic responsiveness in uh, the dentate gyrus. So could you also explain this effect? Sure. So the dentate gyrus is a subregion of the hippocampus. And the dentate gyrus is really important because a lot of the information I was describing before, the, the sensory information that is the basis of memories, comes into the dentate. And the dentate does a couple of things. It has to filter out the extraneous stuff and decide what's important and what's not. So it has this filtering um, function. And it also, it, it also directs traffic, if you will. It, it, the, the, you know, um, the brain, unlike most of our computers, the brain is a parallel processor. It can do many things at once. Computers are serial processors. They do one thing at a time, but very fast. So it seems like it's doing things at one, many things at once. The dentate gyrus is sending information down the correct pathways. But also, because it's filtering out noise, if you don't filter out the noise, then it's like you're, you know, you're trying to take a photograph through a dirty window. You know, it's just uh, it, it, the information is ambiguous and it's not clear. Uh, cholinergic transmission, that's what we call acetylcholine. You know, we just talk about cholinergic effects. Is it, no one says acetylcholinergic effects, just cholinergic effects. And that's what I was really referring to before. But it gets even more complicated because you can ask, if you look at the timing of events in the brain, you know, the acetylcholine isn't just sitting around. It has to be manufactured in the neuron, shipped down along its axon, which is like a long tunnel, get to the end of that axon and be prepared to be shipped out, cross that gap and taken up by the next uh, uh, neuron. And the way this happens is by something called theta oscillations. The brain works on oscillations. There are neurons that fire off signals as fast as 800 times a second. And then there are times when those when neurons are firing off signals at about, you know, one time every three or four seconds. 
So there's a tremendous range in the speed of transmission. And one of the things about encoding memories, as I said before, if you, you know, if you sit down to dinner, let's say you sit down to a holiday dinner, what you remember about it are the, are the, are the things that you see, the food that you taste, the, the conversation that you hear, the environment you're in, all of it. But each of those things, as I said before, are stored in different parts of the brain. So psychologists have said, how does the brain create a whole memory? And they call it the binding problem. How do you bind together these different sensory experiences to have a coherent memory? Well, the way that happens is that different parts of the brain can communicate with regions that are anatomically far away by theta oscillations. And what happens is that the neurons in, um, in one region will oscillate. That is, they'll fire off signals at a theta frequency, which is for which is somewhere between, you know, five to ten hertz, five to ten cycles per second. So signals are coming every five to ten times per second. And when clusters of neurons do that, they can cause clusters of neurons in other parts of the brain to do the same thing and to be in phase with each other. Okay, like musicians have to be in phase with each other. They have to time, they have to play in time. Neurons play in time. And when they do that, your conscious experience is of a memory. There is a part of the brain right in the middle, it's called the medial septum, and it is a major source of acetylcholine in the brain. And it has these long uh, projections, these neuronal axons. And where do they go? Well, they, they target the dentate gyrus. They target some other areas, but the dentate is a major source. So cholinergic transmission oscillating at a theta frequency, meaning that the neurotransmitters are released at five to 10 times per second into that gap to cross over to the postsynaptic neuron, the medial septum to the dentate. In the, when circadian timing is disrupted, this timing mechanism gets broken up. Um, normally you can sustain that oscillation for maybe 12 seconds at a time. In the at, when you screw up circadian timing, it cuts it down to half. So it's sort of like every time you're trying to talk, it just keeps getting cut out. It's like a, it's like a cell phone where you're constantly being cut out and you're getting bits and pieces and you're not sure if the information is correct. That cholinergic transmission from medial septum to dentate that is a, that is the circuit that people study who are interested in Alzheimer's disease. This is where we be the, the, the you know brain begins to break down. And the reason this area is so fragile is that it is constantly restructuring itself to accommodate new memories. And over the course of your life, it just takes a beating. You know, it's it's you know, neurons have scaffolding inside them that are broken down and rebuilt. The, the synaptic connections that change, the, 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 the amount of chemicals that have to be manufactured. It's like a factory in there. And, you know, factories, you know, get old. They, they wear down uh, like a car. Um, this, so this particular part of the brain, it just takes a beating over your lifetime. And that is simply one of the reasons that leads to these cognitive deficits. And so now you add in, uh, you know, the, you know, poor circadian timing and now the signaling just gets worse that cholinergic signaling just gets worse but that is the heart and soul of you know how one navigates an environment and and why people older people can't remember where they put their car keys right and your um i just want to say like your uh, explanation of these terms and these uh phenomenon is really incredible like um, the way that you're um, talking about like the methods and using analogies and all of that, I, I really understand um, almost all of it now. So I wanted to ask you more about your methods uh, when you were making the, or when you were testing the circadian rhythm in these hamsters. So you mentioned there are three ways uh, that experimenting and researchers like you could uh, sort of reset or change uh, circadian rhythm in these animals. You mentioned genetics, um also like simply changing uh the amount of time that they're uh shown light in a day and you also mentioned uh physically accessing the brain uh, and changing variables there so once you were once you were able to change 
uh, the circadian rhythm of these animals artificially. How were you able to measure what exactly that changed in the brain? Uh, uh, sure, sure. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, I want to preface that by saying something. If you, and this is, we should come back to this, but I'm mentioning it now because I don't want to forget it. <laughs> uh, maybe I pour acetylcholine. Okay, so if you, um, okay, so you take these hamsters, you eliminate their circadian timing, and I'll tell you how I know I've eliminated it in just a moment. Okay, we, and so they have poor memory. Now, take another group of, of hamsters, and now let's say we, we go into the brain, we surgically operate on the animal, and we, we cut out this. It's a tiny air, like head of a pin size, and we cut it out, okay? And now we let the animal recover, we wait weeks, the animal completely lacks circadian timing, and now we run it through the same memory tests. Guess what? The animal does just fine. Its memory is perfectly fine. That's a paper I published in 2014 in the journal Science. And we showed that it, it, because what's happening is a malfunctioning SCN interferes with memory. But if you get rid of it, the animal's fine. And that basic finding is something that has been uh, replicated by many laboratories. It just, it, it's, what, it's a great finding because it's what I would call counterintuitive. It goes against everything you think ought to happen. Oh, circadian timing is bad. Great. Well, if we cut out the clock entirely, that'll really screw up the animal. Nope. If you use genetic knockouts to screw up circadian timing, they're also fine. They do okay. It is, um, it's really uh, almost impossible to explain unless you come at it from a different perspective than most people in my field do. Um, but I will get to that in a minute. So let's come back to this. How do I know that the circadian timing is gone? Well, in the 1990s and into the 2000s, one of the big breakthroughs in circadian rhythms was finding out what the genetics of the rhythms were, i.e. what we call the molecular clock. And in 2017, three people in my field won the Nobel Prize because they solved that problem. They figured it out. Um, many laboratories obviously worked on this. And, uh, you know, I mean, my God, probably hundreds of people if you counted them all up. But these three gentlemen shared the Nobel Prize for cracking that code. And essentially what it is, is it, it ended, by the way, it turns out that that molecular clock is not only present in the part of the brain where this timing device is, but the molecular, the same molecular machinery is present in all cells in your body. Okay. And it's very simple how it works. You have... At the very core of it, you have two genes that get transcribed in the nucleus of the cell. That RNA then gets shipped out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, okay, which is the fluid between the nucleus and the cell wall. And out in the side, it's like, you know, uh, if Earth was, if the sun was a nucleus and the galaxy was a cell, then all these stars and planets within it are just floating around, okay? So nucleus is like the sun, except not as hot, okay? So you, you get these, you get this RNA out into the cytoplasm and then, you know, things happen out there. They get turned and coded, red and coded and, and proteins are made. These proteins bind together, they go back into the nucleus and they go right back to the site of origin of where the coding started and they basically shut it off. And that entire sequence takes, guess what, about 24 hours. There are genetic you know, genetic mutations in any of the genes that are involved can speed up the clock, can slow it down. And there are people who have these, who have what's called familial advanced phase sleep syndrome or familial delayed sleep phase syndrome because their clocks run too fast or too slow. So they can't go to bed early. They, some of them only go, so one group advanced phase, they go to bed early, they wake up at, you know, three in the morning every day. Other people go to bed late, they wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and these, it's an inherited trait. These families have been studied. Um, and now we know why this happens. It's molecular clock. So now another question comes up, well, why do we have these, these molecular clocks on all these cells? Well, because like any good orchestra, everybody has to be paying attention to the conductor. So if you have a violinist playing, they can keep time just fine on their own. But now two violinists have to keep time together. Oh, and what about all the other instruments? 
okay, so now we have a problem to solve. How do we solve it? We have a conductor. The biological clock is in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. If you were to look at your eyeballs and look at the giant optic nerves that come out of the back, they go into the brain and they crisscross at some point. And when they crisscross, that's where the clock is. It sits right on top of that. It's a tiny little structure. Um, and it makes sense that it's near the optic chiasm because the information about light in the real world resets the clock. So I guess it's helpful to have the thing near the eyes, which is where light comes in. Okay. What is What we think happens is that this little part of the brain is synchronizing all the other cells in your brain and in your body. So you have these clocks are in your liver, your bones, your skin, your toenails, everywhere. And that is what is happening, is, is the reason your body can work in this coordinated fashion, is that this clock is synchronizing all these things. And you can do things in the laboratory to disrupt them, to desynchronize them. Um, so getting back to how do I know we don't have rhythms? Well, we measure three things. In the beginning, now I just measure one thing. One is I put a motion detector on top of the animal's cage. They're nocturnal. So lots of activity running around at night, eating food, drinking water, grooming. They build nests at night. Um, and then during the day, they mostly don't do much. So that's a daily rhythm. We know that if you then put the animals into total darkness uh, or very dim light, so it's not changing, you get you still have a circadian rhythm the rhythm persists in the absence of external timing cues oh and by the way your body's clocks whether it's a daily clock or an annual clock notice that they match the geophysical cycles in the world how long does it take for the earth to rotate on its axis 24 hours how long does it take to go around the sun 12 months oh wait and by the way we evolved clocks that exactly match those that's not an accident it is to optimize it is to optimize energy resources, but I won't go into that right now. Let me come back to the animal running around in its cage. So what we did was we took these animals and we took out the SCN and we looked at it. And, you know, in normal animals, we looked at the clock genes that are, that are you know, the work that's been, the same clock genes that our Nobel friends looked at, and they oscillate over 24 hours. You know, one of the genes that's important, it's called period gene. It's high during the day and then it's low at night. Another one's called BMAL. It's low during the day and high at night. Okay, we saw that. Now you have animals that have no rhythms. We, we look, at, we, we, we evaluate the animals based on their running around the cage. So animals that don't have rhythms, well, they, eat, they, they don't have that act, night activity. Instead, they're active, they're active for you know, a little while, then they sleep then they're active and then they sleep. So they might be active for 20 minutes, they might be active for two hours, then they sleep for you know anywhere from minutes to an hour, and they just do that all day. Go into their brain, look at the SCN, look at those genes, and guess what? Per is not high during the day, it's low all the time. BMAL is not high at night, it's low all the time. These genes have stopped oscillating entirely. And what has happened is this manipulation of, of turning on the lights at night and, and the jet lag, that just shut off the circadian clock. It just shut it off. Now, what I don't know is how to turn it back on. And you might think this is some weird aberrant thing. But it turns out that it's related to another very complicated phenomenon I won't go into, but it's called singularity. And you'll, I'm telling you this because this is kind of funny. But back when I was in grad school, this woman came to our school, uh, came to our lab to work with us. She, I was at Berkeley. She was from Harvard. And this woman published two papers as an undergraduate in college, one in science and one in nature. Those are the two top scientific journals in the world. Okay. And, and an undergraduate did that. She's brilliant. She's in theoretical mathematics at Harvard now. But when she was an undergraduate, she looked at circadian rhythms in humans and she asked, can I use light to hit the singularity point in humans? Can I make a human arrhythmic? Can I shut off the rhythms in humans? And she did. <laughs> but it only lasted for about 48 hours, but they were unequivocally arrhythmic for that time. And then it spontaneously came back for other reasons. But it um, it's kind of, you know, you think about that, it's like, you shut off the rhythms in, in human beings. Is that, is that okay? You know, 
Well, it is because what she really did was she suppressed their expression to the point where the clock, um, you know, you, you hit it and then it recovers. Okay. In my animals, they don't recover um, because there are some differences between the circadian system of humans and in animals, um, which is not worth going into because honestly, it's, we don't entirely know why, but humans are more resistant. And, um, and, and one reason can be humans are active during the day, hamsters, rats, mice are active at night. So the human visual system is more resilient to the, to the adverse effects of light than a night, nightly active animal is, right? Because it evolved differently. So anyway, yes, it, it can happen in humans. It's not a completely a laboratory you know, artifact. I see. And this is a very interesting um, topic. You were talking about that, um, that, that scientist who was working on uh, doing this kind of experiment in humans. So when humans, uh, when human circadian rhythm is disrupted or uh, it's lost for a period of 48 hours or however long it is, do they, do they feel anything uh, like specifically different or? Right. Um, not that I know of, and keep in mind that when you do these experiments with humans, there are scientists like, like she, one of her jobs in the lab is, you don't you can't leave humans alone you know, in a room. Okay. Like they're under, I hate to say they're under surveillance, but they are constantly. And they know this, um, this was done at Harvard at the sleep center there. And they have this beautiful, like they build an apartment. Like if you could find an apartment like that in a city, and afford it, you'd love living there, except the windows are blocked out, right? Because you they have to control the lights, you know, and you can't read newspapers and you can't watch TV, but they, they have people go in and play games with you. Uh, they'll watch movies with you. Uh, it's really kind of funny. I actually did this at the Stanford with a guy at the Palo Alto VA who does similar work. Um, and, and it's just funny. You just sit with people and, you know, you want to play checkers. Okay. You want to, you know, watch a movie these days, people just bring their, you know, they can't use their laptops either because you have a, you have a clock on it. Right. But they can, you know, um, watch movies and do things like that. So, so it, it's not like they left them alone, but I asked her, I said, were they tired? I mean, you know, cause if you, one of the things you'd expect is they might get sleepy, but it was such a short time. They really didn't. She said, no, nah, they, there was really no change. They ate normally, you know, so, so no, um, I think if it went on for longer then yes, you might see something. Right. And I was just going to ask, like, uh, doing this kind of experiment on, on humans seems a little bit ethically, um, shady, but it's good that they're like, uh, working, like they're doing one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with the human, uh, human test people right right, right. no it, 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 it uh sh I, i'm going to object to the word shady um because that that that's got a, that's kind of loaded um no because look remember that in elderly people they uh, elderly people have you know really not all obviously but you have millions of elderly people who have circadian clocks that have just about broken down okay so they are not that different from your laboratory subjects um and yet, you know, people, you know, they might, they might have disrupted sleep patterns. That would be about the worst thing you would see. But, you know, um, the interesting thing is when you, when you do the manipulation she did, the reason they don't stay arrhythmic forever is one is the human system is more resilient. But if you do this in animals or in uh, insects, you're doing it in the in an animal in organisms that are in total darkness or or very dim light, and as soon as they see any bright light, it resets the clock immediately. So it's not like there was a risk of people never having rhythms again. That that that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, and and also remember, all human experimentation and animals experiments have to go through really heavy review. Um, the International Review Boards, these places, are, are exert a tremendous amount of oversight. And it's also done under, you know, you have the head, the, the, the clinicians in labs are physicians, you know. Um, <laughs> so I think we're okay. Right. So then uh, doing a little bit of disruption on um, circadian rhythm or circadian clocks, in organisms isn't uh, inherently dangerous or anything like that for the for the organism no so if you look at my hamsters and you shut off the clock they're fine they get normal amounts of sleep 
they're fine. Um, in fact, you know, we have a veterinary staff who check them and, uh, you know, they, they don't gain weight. They eat normally. They live to the ripe old age. Uh, they don't develop any spontaneous diseases that we can tell. Uh, they, they are normally active. Um, they don't exhibit any sickness behavior, no fevers, nothing like that. In fact, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Chicago, uh, has been using these animals to do this, but he's an immunologist. And he has found that they're, that it's interesting, their immune system is fine, but if you challenge their immune system um, with an antigen, they are slower to respond. So, so there can be that cost. But again, in a laboratory environment, they don't experience those antigens. You have to artificially, you know, inject them with, uh, you know, it's a, a lipopolysaccharide and it simulates an infection. So you look at the responses to that. It's a very low dose and they do respond, but just not as well as other animals, as an intact animal. So again, disrupted circadian rhythms also has this impact on your immune system. And by the way, something I didn't mention before, which I think you'll find interesting is that if you look at the genetics of the molecular clock, okay, there are these things called transcription factors. And the transcription factors are the things that kickstart the rhythm. Um, they, they, they initiate that reading of the DNA where you make the RNA that then gets sent out into the cytoplasm. That we know now, and this is just amazing, that these transcription factors are, the, are also control a lot of the cell division cycle. So in biology, if you've ever studied mitosis or anything about how cells divide, these same trans transcription factors affect that. So guess what happens? If your biological clock breaks down, we know that in shift workers, they have a huge increased risk for, especially in nurses, where it's been studied the most, a huge increased risk for breast cancer. Why? Well, we think it's because when the circadian timing is screwed up, the transcription factors are misbehaving and, and you end up getting these mutations that then lead to cancer. And in fact, right now I've got a five-year grant from the National Cancer Institute to study why, how disrupted rhythms accelerate tumor growth. Um, and so that's something we're looking at. But the link between circadian rhythms and cancer is an area that is people are flocking to because it's a completely new viewpoint on how cancer begins and how and how tumors can grow, um, and maybe by using circadian manipulations, you can slow it back down and delay the progression of cancer. I see, yeah. and honestly, I would have never associated uh, like circadian rhythm. Uh, with anything like a uh, tumor growth or anything like that, it's really amazing how how interconnected the circadian rhythm is with every other part of the body. Is it true like that for um, for most parts? Yeah, it's um, a really interesting paper came out uh, last year, and this is a controversial paper because it um, it suggests something that has not yet been clinically studied. Although people are looking at it, it's just harder to do. But there's a common cancer drug called tamoxifen, okay? Now, the one thing I hadn't mentioned yet, I think we, you and I might have talked about this before, but there's a hormone called melatonin. Have you heard of it? I have, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people take melatonin at night to help them sleep. Well, your body makes melatonin at night. What happens is, at night, melatonin levels in your bloodstream become very high, and they stay elevated throughout the night and then come down by the morning. That progression is controlled by the biological clock, the SCN that's in the hypothalamus. It controls when it starts. It controls how long melatonin is elevated, and it controls when it comes down. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that you see in cancer um, is that some people develop a resistance to the drug tamoxifen. That is, it becomes ineffective. And in this study, what they did was they, they took these mice and you can actually get tumor tissue and surgically implant it in an animal and then see what factors affect its growth. And it turns out, so they, so they did this with these animals, they gave them tamoxifen and it worked. It treated the tumors. Great. Next experiment. 
we're going to put them in a room and, it, and we're going to do the same experiment. But now at, at night, instead of having it dark, we're going to have dim light. And what light does is it suppresses the hormone melatonin. Okay, light goes through your retina, through the SCN, through a complex pathway I won't bother you with, until it gets to the pineal gland. And that's where melatonin comes from. If you disrupt circadian timing, you almost always obliterate the melatonin signal. So what they did was by turning, put having dim light at night, you give the animals tamoxifen and guess what? The tumors keep growing. The tamoxifen doesn't do anything. So now you go to the third experiment. Okay, same thing. Animals in a room, dim light at night, tamoxifen's having no effect. Oh, but now I'm going to give the animals melatonin. I'm going to put it in their drinking water because they drink at night. And guess what? Tumor shrinks. The melatonin solved the tamoxifen resistance. Okay, so the animals became resistant to tamoxifen because of melatonin. And by giving them, you know, giving them melatonin uh, and correcting that problem, it allowed the tamoxifen to then go ahead and shrink the tumor. So now there's all this clinical interest in melatonin and uh, chemotherapy. So, you know, the message that I hope is coming through here is that rhythms went, circadian rhythms went from do they exist to how do they work to what good are they? And now we are finding the field is exploding. I mean, you should see what they're doing with diabetes now. It's fascinating. Um, but that cancer, dementia, these are big areas of concern for people. And in all those areas, circadian rhythms are offering completely new perspectives to medicine. And so that's a great thing. I see. And now that we're talking about uh, human study and circadian rhythm in, um, in humans, I wanted to ask about uh, the implications of your study in relation to uh, these topics. So although this research study was focused on studying uh, circadian rhythm in hamsters, I assume that one of the uh, end goals was to analyze similar effects on humans. So I was doing some research in the circadian rhythm, and I know that one of the most common problems is that a lot of the times uh, people on their own disrupt their circadian rhythm with things like uh, you know going to bed at nine o'clock one day and then 11 the next, having an inconsistent sleep cycle. So in relation to the human circadian rhythm, what other things do people do that causes these kind of disruptions uh, that like you detailed? <laughs> Yeah, basically everything that's fun in life disrupts your circadian rhythm. You know, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's terrible, you know. Uh, you know, yeah, don't drink, smoke, stay out late, go to parties, talk to people, uh, don't eat chocolate, fried chicken, pizza, you know, don't eat carbohydrates at night. You know, all that stuff, it, it's, it's just bad for you, you know. Uh, just um, eat a nice clean diet, go to bed early, get up and never have any fun and you'll be just fine. Um Look, the, the, <laughs> what do people do? Staying up late is the worst. It really is. You know, it, it just is. Um, because it's hard to, 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 to get the right amount of sleep. And by the way, it's not the amount of sleep that matters. It's the quality of the sleep. Um, so, so that is a pro that that's the, the thing. And the only way you can know about the quality of sleep is to have it tested. Um, but having said that, oh gosh, um, yeah, alcohol, no, it's, no, it's bad for you. Um, it screws up your sleep and your circadian timing. Um, the biggest single problem, though, is industrial lights. You know, since the advent of electricity, we put lights everywhere and people cannot get away from lights. And so at night, you try to go to bed if you live in a city, unless you live in a cave. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have artificial lighting around you and, you know, televisions are terrible, right? Th these things keep, you know, they're hypnotic. It's funny. Um, in my lifetime, I've watched how commercials on television have gotten so sophisticated. If you pay attention to the sound, it is just what your brain wants. It's it, the brain loves familiarity and it loves novelty. And this is why we love music because it gives us both a steady beat is familiar but a solo or an aria, that's novel. So you keep that balance is what makes us love music. If you listen to commercials, now that I've, you know, I've got this nice TV now and I, I hear more in the commercials, they've mastered this, how to keep your attention at almost a subliminal level. So you want to do something healthy, shut off your television and put your computer away. 
which is like saying, don't ever have a cup of coffee or donut again. You know, it's just, you know, but at least you're going to make a choice and know, you know, at least when you're doing it, know it's bad. <laughs> it just shouldn't be. Um, this is a big problem. I have colleagues who work with, who study adolescence and adolescents, because their brains are still developing, shouldn't be getting up at the crack of dawn to go to school. When I was in, when I was in high school, my homeroom started at 7 a.m. Seven. Do you know how early you have to get up where I live to get on a bus to then to get to eat something and get there? And I won't even, you know, I'm going to sound extremely old, but yeah, there was three feet of snow outside. And yes, we had to trudge through it. Yes, stand there and wait for a cold bus. It was the worst thing you could do for yourself. It's terrible. You're cutting off your sleep and you and you're, you're keep forcing that biological clock to make an adjustment, which it doesn't really want to make. And it, it's that tension in the system that is that is also bad for you. So electrical lighting, things that are fun, um, you know, that's really what we do to ourselves. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And now that we're talking about uh, light and its effect on things like the circadian rhythm, I'm a little curious that I know that uh, specifically blue light uh, is an issue with this kind of thing. Do you think you could explain the uh, why blue light? Oh, I, I'm, I'm not really the person to do this, but I'll take a swing at it. And it's funny you say that because one of my collaborators and a dear friend of mine, this is his area of expertise. I mean, this guy knows more about photoreceptors and light. In fact, he's, oh, I, you know, you say one thing and you trigger many thoughts in my head. And one of them is this, you've learned that ultraviolet light is bad for you, right? Yeah, UV light, terrible. Well, guess what? What we're finding out is that tiny amounts of it can actually can actually make your biological clock function better. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's coming down the pike. You're going to hear more about that. Um, and by the way, since we're just free, since I'm free associating here, something I should have told you before. After we've broken the clock and it impairs memory, um, well, let me put it in a broader perspective. For people who are at risk of disrupted circadian clocks, elderly people, long-term cancer patients, um, one of the things you do to bolster the clock is to have people have a better routine, a more so you eat at the same times of day, you go to bed at the right at the same time every day. Those we did this with the hamsters, right? We made them arrhythmic, and then we we instead of letting them eat food whenever they wanted we narrowed the window of time slowly down to four hours, right? So they don't lose any weight, they're fine, but they learn that that's when food is available. And after we did that for a couple of weeks, guess what? Their memory was fine again. Underneath it, they were, they were arrhythmic. That, that SCN is still arrhythmic, but we artificially imposed this rhythm on them and it bolstered their memory. So one of the clinical experiments that hasn't been done is to compare Alzheimer's patients who live at home and have looser schedules to those in institutions where, where they are much more rigorous. Now institutions have their other drawback, can have other drawbacks, but this is one of the, the things that is now being promoted is uh, really uh, is sticking to a routine. You know, um, it, your, your biological clock likes that. As far as blue light goes, it's kind of funny. I noticed on my, you know, um, on my uh, iPhone, it, it's got a mechanism on it so that after some at some time of night, it takes the blue out of the screen. It's like, well, thank you, Apple, for being on the ball about that. Um, yeah, blue light. Oh God, why exactly it's it's bad for you? Is it's very alerting. You know, it 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 it, it stimulates what is called the arousal system in your brain. And, and I'm again, don't hold me to this in a court of law. But essentially, that's what it does. It's it's trying to make you more alert when you don't want to be. Um, that's the problem. So what happens is you think you have more energy than you do, and then you shut it off. You know, oh, I'm tired, and you go to bed, and your biological clock is trying to tell you to go to bed, but the blue light keeps you up, right? So it it artif it makes you think that you are maybe more alert than you really are. So it's sort of like working against your own interests there, where like you have, you know, conflicting sort of parties in your, in your life where you're doing that. Yeah, I, I, I've taught a class on biological clocks at Stanford a couple times, and the students will ask me, 
well, gee, if this you know clock is programming when to go to sleep, why can I stay up late? It's like, well, let me ask you something. You ever been tired at night and then a friend of yours says, there's an incredible party going on across the street. We've got to go. And you say, no, I'm just tired. I think I'll just go to bed now. No, you go to the party, right? You Your motivation overrides that clock. It's like, that's the nature of biology. There are always competing factors going on. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you do things that are against your, so, your own self-interest. That is uh, words to live by. I see. And so we were talking a lot about um, melatonin and other uh, drugs like that. So I wanted to ask you, there are a lot of medical pharmaceuticals uh, like melatonin um, that are basically built to help people fix problems with their circadian rhythm. So do you believe that your research uh, with this seven-year endeavor that you, do, that you have been doing uh, into the circadian rhythm, do you think that this research may help pharmaceutical companies innovate or improve these drugs? It's and how? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny. I, I gave a talk about this a few years ago, and uh, a pharmaceutical rep approached me about acetyl about cholinesterase inhibitors. And at some point, I would like to test them to see if they can if if they really can fix the memory deficits caused by the breakdown of circadian timing. Um, and, and that's something that's in the back of my mind that I will that I will get to, but. It's very hard. One of the things that's extremely difficult in medicine, and I won't say impossible because there are some successes, is to send it, is to take a drug that goes into the brain and make it go to just the area you want it to. Extremely difficult. Okay. In fact, it's 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 just almost not done. Um, it's a scattershot approach. You just hope that enough of the drug reaches the area that you want. So. I think that my research doesn't so much provide a, a roadmap for that, but it, what it does do is give us a different target in the brain, the SCN and the that's in the hypothalamus, as something that could perhaps be bolstered um, and, and, and is a new therapeutic target. But again, the fact that you know scheduled feeding during the day can do this, can fix this, is telling you something else entirely. Why? Why scheduling food? Why can it override such a massive cognitive deficit? Why does it make it better? Well, it's hard to say. We have some ideas. But guess what? One of the things we learned from this older study is that when you schedule feeding like that, you increase excitation in the dentate gyrus, which is what we started talking about. So it's not a drug. It's just food scheduled, and it increases activity there. Um, it turns out, I read a study recently that even 10 minutes of light exercise each day increases activity in the dentate gyrus, which is one of the reasons that, you know, it's kind of like everything new is really old. Um, you know, like your, your grandmother tells you, you know, eat your peas and carrots and oh, by the way, get regular exercise. Well, yeah, that's, that's a great example of, of what happens when you're sedentary, you know, when you become active stimulates your brain in a very specific way right you know so so i don't know if i'm big pharmaceutical companies are going to invest in scheduled feeding but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it at least it, it gives us another way in um so you know. i have friends in the field who are very rigorous about their feeding they eat it like, like clockwork no pun intended but they eat at the same time <laughs> every day they balance their protein, carbs, and fats to meet these schedules. Um, and, and who knows? Uh, there really aren't the good clinical studies yet, but there is something to it. It's clearly um, beneficial. Yeah, that would certainly make for an interesting study, I'm sure. And speaking of uh, studies, so as a, as a senior biology scientist at Stanford, your work has been uh, very focused on the circadian rhythm. So now that you have this seven-year research uh, research behind you, or it's almost finished, do you have any other uh, plans for uh, next projects with your lab with the circadian rhythm? Yeah, I do. Um, there are a lot of things. I think the thing about this particular paper is it's almost like a proof of concept. You know, it, it's saying, look, when this happens, there are deficits in this part of the brain. It is not behaving normally. Why that is the case, that's what we have to find out. Um, I have some specific ideas, 
But one of the things that happens in that study is you take out, you're, you're now dissecting the hippocampus out of the brain and putting it in a dish and studying it. The circuitry that is responsible for the memory deficit, I believe, uh, at least this is the model, is the SCN, which I mentioned, projects to the septal nuclei. I mentioned the medial septum before, which is where those cholinergic neurons begin, and they plug into the dentate. Well, when you put the dentate gyrus in a dish, the medial septum and the SCN aren't there. So you're, you're tearing out part of a circuit and hoping that it still shows some of these deficits. So the next step, a big step would be, and now the technology exists to do this in a, in a living animal, is to put an electrode into the brain, into the dentate, and see how it is in an animal as it's moving through a maze and, and failing to solve problems can we identify what's wrong? You know, is, how is the signaling now uh, with the entire circuit intact? And so that's where I would like to go with that. And the other, there's another experiment, another couple of experiments that should be done, looking at sort of the nitty gritty details of what I said before of how two neurons communicate, what is called synaptic transmission. You may or may not have heard a phrase before called synaptic plasticity which is the you know plasticity in the brain, how it changes based on your experience in the world. It, it, it is modified. Um, we have some specific ideas there, but that is what I would like to do. I would like to be able to look at the circuit in an animal while it's actually engaged in a memory test. Right. Yeah. And especially considering how interconnected circadian rhythm is with everyone else, the possibilities are practically endless for what you could do or what you could test. Uh, with their circadian rhythm. That's right. That's right. Uh, there are competing ideas out there about why why disrupted rhythms have produced memory deficits. And I have come at this from a different perspective than my colleagues um, because I have a different background. And I think there's something much more interesting going on here, um, which is not so much about circadian rhythms, but about these theta oscillations of the brain I mentioned earlier. And because theta has the, you see, the SCN is a tiny structure. The hippocampus, the dentate gyrus hippocampus, that's a massive structure in the brain. And I keep asking myself, how does such a little tiny new center like the SCN affect such a massive structure? You know, it's like trying to knock over a building with a skateboard. You know, it's just like, how, it's, how, how does it happen? Well, if the SCN is involved in these theta oscillations, then that opens the door for it to have access to all these other brain regions. And I think that's the thing that's missing. Um, that is the link that I need to make. So that's a lot of what I'm going to be doing moving forward. And I think that it's, it's a productive direction because... I think it can lead to therapeutics. Um, I think there's a way that's the inroad to making this actually useful to people. I see. So I wanted to ask you now, as a conclusion to our interview, uh, I wanted to ask you about the general implications of the research that you conducted over the past seven years uh, about the effects of disrupting circadian rhythm. We talked about pharmaceuticals uh, a little bit, but above that, do you believe that the discovery that you've made uh, will have a major effect on research into the circadian rhythm going forward into the future? Absolutely. I really do. I think that what I've done, what this paper has done is so completely novel in our field that it's the first time someone that anybody has offered an actual mechanism. It's like, okay, rhythms are bad for you. We know jet lag is bad for you. We know chronic jet lag is bad. We know shift work is bad for you. Why does it impair memory? Why do all these have these memory deficits? It's just no one's had an animal model to be able to even ask these questions. It's just no way to even ask. Now we do. And now we've shown that, you know, it's kind of like we've finally, we finally put a flag in the ground and said, okay, here's where we're going to start. This dentate gyrus is a gateway for information processing. And this is where we're seeing this deficit. And by the way, the deficits we see in its functioning are ones that are absolutely already known to us that are critical for memory. So, yeah, I think it will. I, I absolutely do. It's going to be tough because it everything I just said is true, but it's coming from a different perspective than people are used to. So getting people to pay attention to it 
it's not like uh, turning around a speedboat. It's like trying to get an oil tanker to make a left turn. You got to, it's going to take time. You know, it just, it's a slow process. But as more research, as we do more research, I think we'll build our case and, and people will embrace it because and they'll embrace it because it's useful, because they can, they can see the, the, the value of it and, the, uh, and how it can be adapted to benefit people in medicine. Right. And with all the potential that you're, dis- um, that you're discussing with uh, just studying the circadian rhythm, I, for one, am extremely excited to see what comes next uh, in the field, what research is going to uh, pop up next, what new discoveries. So, Dr. Ruby, thank you so much for appearing on this podcast. It was really, really fun talking with you about your study. Uh, I learned a lot. And good luck with the with the rest of your studies going forward with the circadian rhythm and in general. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me. And uh, someday when you're a student at Stanford, come look me up, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.